Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams Deep Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. This week, it is our 90th episode. Oh, my God. It's a cause for celebration, balloons, sparklers, fireworks, air horns. I have bourbon. And this week, like we do every week, we're going to be talking about two brand new releases from two artists. We're going to be talking about the new album from Sharon Van Etten. Uh, what? How do I classify her specifically? What is she a she's musician? A, she's like, a, a woman. She's an she's an indie <laughs> indie singer songwriter and producer. Okay, what a concept. Her, a woman. her her new album. We've been going about this all wrong. Long title, and we're also gonna be talking about an album that has the title in that title, which is We. By archive, ar- 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 Yo! <laughs> How did I actually just notice that when you said that? That they both I, I the picked it up today and was just kind of like, That's- I was <laughs> hoping somebody would notice. <laughs> Were you talking about their new album, uh, their first one since that one album that nobody liked? And on this week's record club, Riley's recommended record this week is Fort Minor. So, you know. Get ready for that. It's, the a, rising fo- it's, tide. it's a fucking Fort Major, if you ask me. Oh, what a shit. throwback to freshman year. Wow. Yeah. And of course, this week we are joined by our guest. We are joined once again by Brett and Morgan is back. Oh, hey, it's our hey, first full installment hey. of the current podcast lineup in some time. So. And it's fitting because this is the 90th episode of our podcast, of the main series anyway. So we are rapidly approaching a big milestone, which is 100 episodes. We're going to be hitting that in July. And believe you me, and it's going to be fun. We're going to be hitting 1,300 subscribers very, very soon. So. And if you can believe it, you <laughs> Has so someone done an edit of D- David Lynch saying that with like Soldier Boy playing play <laughs> over? So. Well, I don't know, but you have some homework now. And if you, uh, besides that, this week on channel, we just put up our most recent episode in the Bjork retrospective where we talked about Medulla with Jacob Sanchez. And that's a really great discussion about an album that deserves to be discussed more. So if you haven't caught up with that series yet, go right ahead and do that. As well as the fact that, of course, because what I would say is certainly the musical event of the year is happening on tomorrow, which is the release of the new album from Kendrick Lamar, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. No, it's not happening tomorrow, Jake. It happened two days ago at least. Oh, yeah. I, on, I don't. Jake. I don't care. The point is, is that if you want to catch up a little bit with his discography and maybe want to hear some thoughts about it, recontextualize yourself because it's been five years since. Riley and I made a video just for you where we talked about his entire discography. So maybe binge that for the new record so you can go in with a full perspective. Yeah, and we will be joined next week as well by Adequate Emily to review that too. So it's going to be a pretty yes. big episode, I think. Hopefully, uh-huh. I, I'm sure that I speak on behalf of everyone in this podcast um, that, you know, that Morgan and August will be present for that as well because it's fucking Kendrick Lamar. Like, you're not going to not listen to that. No one is going to not listen to also, that. So like, Technically, Radiohead also kind of yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, Radiohead in all fucking name. name. So we're essentially yeah. next week's episode is essentially Kendrick like, Lamar. What year is this? Two thousand eleven. I mean, real though. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> oh. I don't like that. Anyway, let's get into what we've been listening to in the last seven days, as per usual. Jake, what have you been listening to? Well, honestly, not a whole lot. Life has been busy. Uh, That said, still got some time to listen to some decent stuff. I think it was probably spurred on by the fact that I talked about Waiting for Burial last week. The uh, project that's on the same. Planning for Burial. Um, which is on the same label and just generally it's is waiting for silent. Godot, but it's for, <laughs> for the artist to burial. Well, it's wait, waiting for burial is what <laughs> I've been doing for the last, like ever since Untrue came out. I've been waiting for burial to release I've another been waiting album. For burial since I've been born. What? <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I listened to that last week. We are destined uh, to die. <laughs> I listened to that last Wait, week. What? And <laughs> I don't know. Fred just found out about death on the podcast. 
fans yo, about bro, it. But... Man. Just yo, bro. <laughs> wait, wait. Life, life ends with death, bro. <laughs> spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> just, it just found out about dying. Shit sucks, man. Jake, what have you been listening to? I've been listening to. <laughs> after I mentioned that band last week, I just, I, I got on a bit of a have a nice life kick. Uh, where I mean, Death Consciousness, one of my five favorite albums of all time. So I spun that a little bit. So that's obviously nothing new. Um, but I also took a, a re listen to like everything that basically Dan Barrett has had his hands in sans Giles Corey, just because while I love that album, uh, I have to be near suicidally depressed to be able to listen to it uh, in a way that deser- is deserving of its attention. Um, but there are lots of stuff that like Dan has made that just doesn't get as much attention um, just because like he is interested in far more than just the music under that particular label. So I listened to a number of things, first of which I'll talk about is the black metal kind of ambient or black ambient project that I think he still has with I think that's still Dan and Tim. It might just be him. I'm not exactly certain, but it's called Na it's N H A V A L R. If you can pronounce that, good for you. Narwhal. I can. It's Narwhal. I listened to their black metal project, Narwhal. Um, which that's one thing. It's funny just because everything that Dan has made, like aside from the first two Have a Nice Life albums, not exactly looked at very favorably. Um, this is not exactly a project that people are overwhelmingly in love with, which actually I kind of am, and I get why after hearing it, is because this is the ugliest album I've ever listened to. This is far and away the most unfriendly incarnation of black metal and black ambient shit I could possibly imagine. Um, it's a, the mix of it is not what I would traditionally call good. Everything sounds very brittle and hollow. I cannot promise that anyone will enjoy it. That said, I listened to it and was profoundly disturbed by it. It's like if someone distilled, you know how in the movie, The House That Jack Built, the very end, he's just like, ah, yes, that high pitched noise is the sound of all the souls in hell spiraling together and then being filtered through this one tunnel. That's what this whole album sounds like. It's like that there's like, there's some like screaming shit on it. Some of it's like instrumental. It opens up with this uh, spoken word piece that talks about this thing that happened in I think Siberia where supposedly someone uncovered a tunnel to hell and a preacher is talking about it. And then like he's speaking on it and then the song just sort of comes in when he's about to describe what it sounds like. And boy, howdy, that shit hits. Uh, this is something to listen to when you are in the worst possible mood, when you are feeling adequately dark, you may find it like, even if you are a fan of Have a Nice Life, which are not exactly, that's not a musical project known for high fidelity, but even by their standards, this is, nasty sounding kind of loved it uh so if you're a black metal or black ambient fan i would get on that shit uh or if you're just a death consciousness fan same kind of appeal just a little bit different of a sound it's just super unfriendly what what Um, if you're a white ambient fan then you're august um Anyway, uh, I also listened to uh, The Unnatural World, which is the follow-up to Death Consciousness, which I think is, it's received well. It's definitely the project other than that that's considered the highest. And I still somehow think it's underrated. I like it a lot more every time I listen to it. It's a little bit more polished than Death Consciousness is. And I think that might be why some people don't fall in love with it in the same way they do that album. But it's a really great refinement of their sound, which it really feels like it has a like death consciousness is more despondent whereas i feel the unnatural world is kind of not necessarily livelier but it feels a little bit more organic sounding i feel like there's a lot less heavily like an like less of an electronic presence on that project 
Um, but I, I still think that it's really, really damn good. And as well as Sea of Worry, which is another album that not a lot of people like a whole lot. And I really like it. It's yeah, like great record. It's, it's, it's basically Have a Nice Life's Slow Dive self-titled in that it is a really, it's a more accessible, refined version of what he's done. It's like the most purely post-punk thing he's ever made. But in doing so, he really taps into a kind of lively aggression that the last two albums didn't have. Uh, and well, I, I remember when that album first came out and I just dug the shit out of it and nobody talked about it. But so here's the sucked. thing, Jake, is that if you like Sea of Worry, you should listen to the two records that Dan released as Black Wing because... They yeah, yeah. both, particularly 2020's No Moon, which is one of my favorite records of that year, that is just another, more of the same of Sea of Worry. If you like the songs on that record, it's dancey, it's intense, it's apocalyptic, it is tender. And I love when Dan demonstrates that kind of versatility. And I think that it's one of the more underappreciated yeah. aspects because people go to records like Death Consciousness for the crushing intensity of it all, but beneath all of that there's always a tenderness that comes through and um the records always all sound fantastic anyway i, I never get any oh, yeah. about the sound of a record like sea of worry like uh, people who say that record is too polished like do you remember the song lords of treasure horn because that is the single most lo-fi have a nice life song that has ever been released and it's also one of their best so maybe give that record another shot people were so mean to that record because all of the, like almost all of the songs on it were already on like voids or pre-released records. And they just felt that like, Oh, uh, the voids versions are so much better. And some of them are decent is better on voids, but still it's trespassers. W is one of the best songs they ever made. And I like the version on voids a little better. Yeah. And also like uh, another song that they had previously done already, but they redid for one of their albums for the unnatural world. That is one of my favorite have a nice life songs, which is defenestration song. Like sounds great, great. on its original yep. form. Sounds great on unnatural world. So I don't know. I think that Dan gets a bit of slack for, I don't know, not maybe living up to a particular aesthetic or sound that he was into in the late two thousands. But honestly, I've only get more and more impressed with his more polished stuff. And I think that, Personally, No Moon, the Black Wing record, is my second favorite thing he's ever made after Death Consciousness. So people need to be giving it a fair shot. I would be putting it in my upper, like the more towards the top of my list than I think most people would. I very much agree with that. I'd actually say for as much as I love Sea of Worry, I like the uh, Black Wing more, honestly. Uh, It's not exactly by a huge margin, but I do. That said, he also has a project that is very interesting. It's called Now While They Aren't Looking, Tear It Apart uh, under the name of Gate. And this is one project that's an EP. It's like five songs long. It's it, And none of them are particularly long songs. And it's just like the most lo-fi post-punk I've ever heard. Um, can understand why people wouldn't like that. I did. Not as much as I did his other stuff, just because it does feel like a prototype for a sound that should develop into something bigger and better. Um, but it, again, if you like really grimy post-punk, that's a stellar EP, uh, as well as the fact that there's also an EP called Powers of Ten, which is basically just a couple of the songs from Death Consciousness uh, resequenced into like a five or six song long EP, which honestly works as its own experience. Uh, Earth Mover is the penultimate track on that. Interesting experience not having that be the closer. Other than all the have a nice life shit, uh, I can't remember if it was last week or it, it's just been at some time in the past where Riley has recommended that I listen to the sort of post rock band uh, Jisoo, uh, which I've needed to for a long time. And you mentioned that their uh, EP uh, Silver is one of your favorites. And I figured, why the fuck? Does she, well, I should just start there. It's short, might as well. And I really love this. This is, I mean, if you're looking for that great kind of heavy but still really atmospheric post-rock and want to get into that band pretty great place to start honestly it's it's just a really really fundamentally solid really beautiful sounding ep uh highly recommend that uh yeah. really want to go through the rest of jisoo's catalog after this too absolutely they've got a lot of good like remastered shit too which i really want to check out so yeah. you know uh brett i know brett you're a fan of 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 jisoo and of this ep anyway in general as well yeah. like i think we were discussing the other day how the title track silver which is one of the best sort of post metal songs i think like in general it's it's a fantastic track and um the ep itself i think really holds up i went through a huge 
post metal phase when I was like a teenager, like specifically like metal that was really slow and sludgy and shoegaze influenced. And if it was anything like that, I was into it. And Jisoo were a huge fixation for me when I was like 16 and super into that. And their self-titled record, which is a, a very beloved album, but also their incredibly underrated 2013 record, Every Day I Get Closer to the Light from Which I Came, were on huge rotation for me then. So both of those records, I recommend checking out. Um, uh, Jisoo, I'm super interested in that Sun Kill Moon collab. I want to know how that sounds like. There's wow. two. T- they made two records together, actually. They made two? Uh, yeah. Uh, a self-titled one and one called uh, 30 Seconds to the Decline of Planet Earth. They are both interesting projects. They're both far longer than they need to be, but also they're both frequently the beautiful. Uh, the first one, Jisoo Sel- Sun Kill Moon, actually has multiple songs that have Rachel Goswell of Slow Dive on them. Um, and oh, she's a, a gorgeous presence on those tracks. Ellen and Mimi from Low are on that record as well. Uh, even Isaac Brock from Modest Mouse is on there. Will Oldham from Bonnie Jesus. Prince Billy is on there. Uh, oh, this is added immediately. Yeah, and 30 Seconds to the Damn. Decline of Planet Earth is uh, pretty much just as good as well. Uh, there's a great song on that record where it called He's Bad, where it's essentially just Mark Kozilek ranting for seven minutes about how much he fucking hates michael jackson and he just kind of like talks about how much of a now i know obviously it's kind of rich hearing him talk about how much of a sex pest michael jackson was considering how much of a sex pest mark kozalik is but if you divorce yourself from that for a second it's a very funny song uh and it's just very like stupid um, but you also get, of course, because it's a Mark Kozalik project, you also get like a 17 minute song called Wheat Bread, which is just so Mark Kozalik that it's almost parody. But when you combine Mark Kozalik with Justin Broderick of Jisoo, it, I think, adds an additional texture and flavor to those two projects that I think makes them worth checking out. But you have to have a tolerance for 70 minutes of Mark Kozalik because both of those records are 70 minutes long. But yeah, they're, 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 they're worth checking out if you enjoy Sun Kill Moon and if you enjoy Jizu and Slowcore in general. Uh, really, really solid releases. Bit of a big listen that I'm pretty sure everyone who hasn't heard it yet will love it. And that'd be, I finally listened to in preparation for the new album, which I think is coming out tomorrow, if I remember correctly. I listened to The Moon is a Dead World oh, by shit. Gospel. The fucking uh, post-hardcore progressive rock screamo metalcore extreme music gobbledygook of genres the whatever the fuck it's great um uh it's like 39 minutes and it'll beat your ass for most of it it's got some of the most alien sounding guitar tones i've ever heard um and it's just like i mean i cannot not recommend this to anyone who is even vaguely interesting interested in the idea of it just because it combines so many different genres and manages to like basically flesh out an aspect of their sound that fully pays tribute to those influences and it'll you'll get such a satisfying experience out of it if you want a good metalcore album you'll get that if you want a good progressive rock album you'll get that uh i, I would say that it's kind of like if granted if they put in a different singer this could be like the missing link between deloused and the comatorium and relationship of command like at the very center between these two albums is moon is a dead world uh and it bangs yes. uh, all Sorry. the way through nothing uh, less than stellar on there yeah i'm glad uh, i had no idea you listened to that by the way one of my favorite post hardcore mm. records ever a record that uh our friend connor considers one of his yep. top 10 favorite records of all time i think and uh is a very mm. close to getting a 10 from me it's a very strong nine uh that record came out in 2005 uh, completely changed the game up. I like to think of gospel at doing for post hardcore what Gore Guts did for death metal in the sense that yeah. it is a really yeah. musically sophisticated album. Like you don't have to have a super knowledgeable background in like composition and theory and stuff to appreciate the fact that the arrangements and just the kind of progressions and the melodies and everything is like super like on another plane. Like it's some death spell Ooh. omega shit to a certain extent, but it's also like got yeah. an immediacy to it because of the post hardcore, you know, backing and, and setting of what the music is. That means it's not really a difficult record to get into. I don't think really tight, Ooh. really fantastic. Uh, God, that album rules so fucking much. And you're right. They have a new album, their first album in 16 years out today 
uh, and it's already getting rave reviews on the internet from fans. I'm excited to check Ooh. it out. I am so hyped for this band right now. I'm so glad that they're yeah. back. And I am so glad that you enjoyed this record because things that are like this sort of intense and crazy can sometimes be hit or miss when I rec- recommend them. So I'm super stoked that this one has landed. Yeah, there's there's no chance I wasn't going to love this, frankly. Um, so yeah, everybody go listen to that underrated gem of a record. Get prepared for that new one too, because I mean, if anybody deserves to keep making music, it's these guys. They clearly have a, their fingers on the pulse of what's happening in their sort of weird left field extreme music place they've made for themselves. And I think another thing, yeah, I'll shout out a new album that came out last week. Um, this is a collaborative record from the Funeral Doom, Blackened Doom metal band uh, Mismore and Thou. Um, Thou actually had a project with Kentucky's own Emma Ruth Rundle. Uh, I mentioned that on what we've been listening to on like the first year of the podcast that I really, really liked. And this here, definitely not the same kind of music. It's This leans heavily into a sort of proto black sabbath stoner metal kind of shit but like with with a sort of doominess that i mean like i'd say is comparable to the most recent sleep album if you really like that you will really like this album it is titanic it is just an absolutely like crushing ruinous and then like the vocalist of me's more is just like howling his ass off on this record which you don't normally get with uh this kind of music but the sort of blackened approach to the sound is really refreshing it's just an insanely consistent listen and it's heavy enough to absolutely just fucking run you over so if you're looking for some some really sort of classic sounding shit you really like early black sabbath if you really like sleep or dope smoker this is an album for you. Uh, totally go listen to it. I also listened to, I guess what is a bit of a, like a, I'd say that this is one of the more important albums I've listened to in recent memory. Uh, in that I kind of sort of like, I knew that uh, this podcast specifically Morgan and Riley had been listening to Ryuichi Sakamoto in the last couple of months. Uh, and I love a lot of his stuff. I have listened to his score music and normal stuff uh, a lot. But I kind of wanted to go back further than that when I found out that that is not the extent of his career whatsoever, because he started out in a band called Yellow Magic Orchestra, yes. which is basically the, the blueprint for synth pop, like the, the ground zero citizen cane for this shit. And Ryuichi Sakamoto was part of that band. And I'm like, well, fuck, I don't know how I went my life without knowing this, Okay. And then I listened to it and I'll be damned. This is some really great shit. I mean, your mileage with it will vary somewhat because obviously since this is like ground zero, the synth tones can occasionally be kind of dated sounding, kind of rudimentary, I guess, but it's how they're employed that's great. The melodies, the rhythms on here, they are vacuum sealed. They are so tight. Like everything on here, I would also venture to say another reason I listened to this is because a a YouTuber that I watched a lot of was talking about video game soundtracks and talked about how much specifically the Super Nintendo owed, so the composers who made music for that console owed basically all of their compositional, like the, the blueprints from Yellow Magic Orchestra. And once I listened to this, I was like, I completely understand why. Because if you like those old like Final Fantasy SNES soundtracks, this plays exactly like those. Um, The remaster I listened to is unbelievably crisp sounding. I mean, you can feel the influence here of everything from the compositions of uh, Nobuo Uematsu for the Final Fantasy series. You could hear the inspiration for shit like Talking Heads and Devo. And there's even a cover here of the Beatles' Day Tripper, which is really good. <laughs> it's, it's really fun. Um, it, I, I definitely want to listen to more of their shit just because this is clearly a band who are like really revered and very important. And I just don't really hear a lot of people giving them, the, I guess, the credit that they deserve now. Mm. So I want to listen to more of that before I listen to more of uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto in general. But yeah, totally, totally recommend that. 
but that's pretty much been it for my week. First thing I want to talk about is uh, Rammstein's album, Mutter. Uh, Rammstein Ooh. are, of course, a uh, German new hardcore band. This is their third album, and from what I've heard, easily their best. I think this, I they're a group who have a very, like, single-minded nature to what they sound like and this is an album that i think really successfully expands on their kind of hardcore metal formula and adds in some really satisfying electronic elements to the mix in just a really kinetic way i've never been like some gigantic uh rammstein fan but if there's anything that's going to convince you of this band's merit, it's going to be this album because there are some fucking catchy songs. There are some great hooks, even if it's all in German and they're, they're singing about like having anal sex with your own cousin. Uh, they're a pretty good band. I, uh, I, all I will say on this is that I would object to necessarily calling it easily their best record i think that their first four records uh god it's been so long since i've listened to them my dad weirdly was super into that ramstein um that's so that makes so much sense but yeah. their first four records i think are all varying degrees of very good to quite great uh, i don't even i would need to revisit them to in order to, to even say which one i like the most but it's yeah, Mutter is a is a classic for good reason, but Rammstein are by no means a one-trick pony. They've been around a while and they've been reasonably mm. consistent. They actually put out a new record a couple of weeks ago, yeah. I think. So uh, I'll Zeit. be curious. I'll be curious to check that out. Um, they're always uh, interesting and they're always themselves, even if they don't always hit it off. Um, but yeah, I, I would be very they, curious to see. Um, I'm, I would be very curious to see if you do end up checking out any other Rammstein records. I, I have heard their second album as well uh whatever it's Den called yeah. uh yes uh no i think they've i really do think they've got a very interesting vision for what they want to do with their music and if nothing else it's like admirable and it's something i can listen to quite easily so i i i definitely wouldn't object to a year's time listening to another one or something mm. uh yeah so i enjoyed them I enjoy their music. Uh, get a recommendation from moi. I listened to the, uh, and just so Connor doesn't crucify me here, the fourth Thursday album, A City Divided by the Light. I think this record's interesting. It comes with a change of producer from their, uh, from uh, Full Collapse and War All the Time. And yeah, Fridman produced this one, I think. Yeah, Fridman did. This album comes with some really interesting new influences for the band because it seems they've gotten much bigger into more progressive song structures. There's a little more post-hardcore, no, not post-hard, post-rock and even progressive rock kind of splashed into this album. And I, I really like those influences. I don't think they pan out consistently, like all the time on this album, but they pan out enough that it was an interesting enough listening experience uh, for me to say it was worth my time and worth yours if you're a Thursday fan or just a post-hardcore emo fan. If that's your shit, uh, check it out because it's it's doing enough that's unique to them and being a bold experimental enough album that you might even get more out of it than I do. Another thing I listened to was an EP called Ghastly Funeral Theater by a Japanese black metal band called Psy. This is crazy. Not necessarily in like a just over the top, like consistently wacky way. But when you analyze the musical DNA of this, it's so like all over the place and fun because they are taking some some more like symphonic influences, some like traditional Japanese in, like Japanese uh, traditional folk music influences, some like progressive metal influences, and the aforementioned black metal, and coating that all on top of it 
and each other for like 23 minutes of just crazy fun kinetic uh metal it's not consistent at all in the sense that there's like half of it is interludes but it's still a very fun interesting project if you're into any of those kinds of sounds and just like metal that's maybe a tad more on the challenging side and from what i understand the band does have a pretty healthy catalog of other records which i just haven't heard because i've only listened to this one ep so that will uh that will be something i get to speaking of records which are what we are talking about i listened to uh a, a third album from the band uh pearl jam vitalogy so this is a very interesting album because for its first half it's my favorite pearl jam album hands down and then the second half happens and oh you mean very... the second half that has songs like uh corduroy and bitter man and immortality yeah the, the, the oh, real, oh the yeah real, those the real drop yeah. off yeah with oh yeah and stupid mop and pry two and bugs Just very big bugs. look i do like some of the songs on the second half but i find it gets so wildly inconsistent but 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 i wasn't done yet i have so much respect for the band for doing this because i love the boldness of what they're doing here it's so like the confidence you have to have to put out a record like this uh, with these so, like to put out a record where you're ascent ostensibly putting a, a lot of just really weird kind of random bits and pieces on there i think it's a bold enough and interesting idea that certainly separates them from a lot of the like utter garbage who they went on to influence so a, on that respect i respect it a ton but on the other hand i don't really think the ins the like weirder stuff is all that weird i don't think this album goes far enough is my point like i think the weird bits to me ring off ring is more boring and kind of playing it safe for being experimental than anything else quite honestly so in that sense that was what really disappointed me about this album that it didn't live up to that expectation of balls to the wall craziness that it's kind of had some cultural cachet placed on it for still great songs on here you're not gonna catch me not saying that i i love some of the shit on here it's just there are parts that i don't think go far enough with how weird they want to be morgan what have you been listening to in the last time i recently saw a menzinger's concert and uh you know that was the shit uh, but they had two bands opening for them. One was called Sincere Engineer, which put on a great show, but I have yet to check out uh, an album of theirs yet. Uh, and the other was Oso oh Oso. Oh and to prepare for that show, I listened to their last two albums, uh, the most recent of which, Sore Thumb, which is good, um, didn't leave the biggest impression on me. But their, uh, their 2019 release, uh, Basking in the Glow, I found to be a good bit stronger mm. and has only grown on me the more and more that I have listened to it. Yeah, really love that album. Really love the tracks, the title track and uh, Dig, for instance. Yeah, that, that uh, album was a record that was on rotation a lot for me in 2019 when it came out. Uh, well, I think the biggest selling appeal of, of Oso Oso is just like the fantastic vocal presence of Jade Lewis Tree. Like, I, and I think like maybe Sore Thumb and it's sort of more stripped back nature, like maybe leans too heavily on that. Although I enjoy that record a great deal for how great the vocals sound. But Basking in the Glow is 
really their breakthrough along with the unihon mixtape which came just before it which is just about as good in my opinion basking in the glow is just one of those really special genuinely pleasant and, and life-affirming emo records from this kind of like late fourth wave sort of emo era of like bands like foxing and the hotel year and etc and and i suppose the menzingers are not emo but they're sort of semi-tangential to that world mm -hmm. which is why i suppose i'm not surprised that oso oso would open for them but yeah i love that album basking in the glow i haven't listened to it since 2019 i should really go back but i listened to it a lot that year fuck good band i also listened to uh, on this on the note of ryuichi sakamoto i also listened to one of his non-soundtrack albums uh, uh async in particular definitely leans into more of the sort of electronic side of his sound and i really enjoyed that a uh, really strong sort of almost ambient in places uh release from him even though it is still also quite busy at times good you shit know, uh, I, to sell to sell riley further on ryuichi sakamoto's early shit that i talked about there were parts on that album where i was just like damn this sounds like early all tecker like I, I that album's influence really can't be uh, understated like I, the fact that he has that sort of side to him doesn't shock me at all right now what i've been listening to mm. for the last seven days i'll keep this brief because i haven't listened been listening to a huge amount of music but i have three records i'm going to talk about and i am going to talk about the two that i love because two of them i absolutely love and then one of them is the worst album, one of the worst albums of the year. So let's start with the two that I love. The first is that I listened to a record from the fantastic uh, indie rock power pop band 12 Rods, who are, I guess, one of the most sort of critically beloved indie rock records uh, bands of the 90s. Very much sort of like for fans of the dismemberment plan, for fans of that kind of like super neurotic, really sort of like... Uh, geeky and sort of painfully queer uh indie rock then 12 rods is exactly in that vein i mean dismemberment plan isn't really queer that much but 12 rods is like if the dismemberment i don't know about plan. that you heard that motherfucker saying yeah but 12 rods okay. is like if the dismemberment plan were like actually really queer like uh i listened to the record split personalities from 1998 uh and i thought this was fucking fantastic from front to back i absolutely loved this album completely blew me away a very unique and interesting fusion of indie rock and power pop and, and sort of eccentric very 90s shit um shades of bands like pavement and stuff but it's all very like uh just geeky really neurotic stuff i really loved it there's a song on there called red that is one of the probably one of the best indie rock songs of the late 90s i think there is a great song on there called I Wish You Were a Girl that is like one of, again, incredibly gay song. It's going to put some people off, I think, because of certain aspects of the way that it's sung and the way that it's delivered. But if you're a neurotic queer youth, then you will find it to be an emotionally tangible experience at the very least. But yeah, it's just a fantastic record from front to back. Some really interesting musicality and, and musical um, ambition. There are a couple of moments that don't quite fully land with the same emphasis as everything else, but not enough for me to call this anything less than properly excellent from front to back. So 12 Rods, Split Personalities gets a very strong recommendation from me. I'm looking forward to checking out their other major beloved record, Lost Time, uh, as soon as I can as well. Um, but the other thing that I love that I want to check out is a very August core record, one that I... Put it, decided to listen to on a whim mostly because i had just kind of hit me this week like, oh, where the fuck haven't i heard this yet i'm such a fucking idiot and so i finally sat down and listened to the kinks are the village green preservation society which yes. is uh one of the two one of not just two but there were a number of canonical kinks records in the late 60s early 70s and I was familiar with some of the earlier stuff, like Face to Face and something else, records that I think were really good. In fact, no, great records that just have these kind of astounding highs that you think of when you think of them. But Village Green Preservation Society is a masterpiece. Like, yes, genuinely, right. it is 15 songs and they're all fantastic. 
like there's definitely favorites that I have, but there's no point on the record where I'm really anything less than completely in awe of how great this band is, how good the songwriting of Ray Davies is, how musically adventurous and kind of intricate these songs are. The vast majority of them are only two minutes long, but they pack so many musical ideas into those two minutes that it's just an, a completely densely packed record of just some of the best songs of the 60s. I, I, I tweeted kind of semi-baitingly that it's better than any Beatles album. And I wasn't doing that to be like super hot takey or anything because... I think, as we've discussed on this podcast, the Beatles have some undeniably stellar albums. But to a certain extent, like the Beatles are, sometimes they can be more important and more revolutionary than more front-to-back fantastic in the album format. Whereas the Kinks are that. They are both revolutionary and and super important and in their own way, but also masters of the album format. The and- Kinks are an album band through and through. And like Ray Davies is such a conceptually ambitious songwriter. And I guess that's kind of a, a detail you've alluded to that his his style of writing is so witty, but it's also doing so much more than what's on the surface because he's he's drawing deep, intimate connections between like, all of the songs to create these very vivid portraits of a very particular time and place and it's it's just like and going over so many thematic ideas within that it's so beautiful and like only gets better with stuff like arthur and and like lola versus uh power man and the money go round is also a really phenomenal album like i I cannot like express in words just how happy I am that you've finally taken the plunge into this band's like amazing, amazing material because. I mean, I feel like I can't yeah. emphasize enough how like actually fucking in love I am with this album. Like I, I yes. unequivocal masterpiece, um, particularly, I mean, really the first the a side in particular like there's not to say the b side yeah. drops off anyway but the a side is astounding songs like the title track of course songs like do you remember walter songs like do johnny thunder big sky johnny thunder just like oh gosh you have and- what feels like a, a, a an entire lifetime's worth of emotion and and uh yes things unsaid oh and, and stories that are as powerful for what's not said and for what's evoked than for what is said and it's all again as i say jam-packed into songs that are usually not even reaching the three minute mark it's astonishing uh and then the 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 b-side still has animal farm village green uh probably the biggest song on this album starstruck and the incredibly underrated phenomenal cat all of my friends were there like just like (sighs) and here's what's so crazy about this album is even like because I, I've, of course, read a lot about, like, Ray's personal feelings. And he's interestingly not satisfied with a lot of the album. Uh, in very, inter- like, Big Sky is a song in particular where he's like, I wish I didn't sing that song. I wish I wasn't the vocalist. I wish I got someone else to do it. And it's like, no, you're you're brilliant. Please. Fantastic. He, he's, uh, that's a top three song on the record for me, actually, Big Sky. Uh, yes. Absolutely. I love that song. Oh, there's uh, um, the, a band I've mentioned before, uh, Flop, actually has an amazing cover of that song on And the Fall of Mop Squeezer. Uh, yeah, I've got to listen to that too. I, yes, that's, yeah, a, that's been on that's the list for a while. Kick ass cover of that song. And, you know, it's a fucking great song too. So. I mean, unquestionably, but yeah, the Kinks. I mean, we don't talk enough about them in general. We like, don't. I don't see enough they... people on the internet talking about them in terms of what a great band they are. Maybe that's for the best. Maybe that has kind of lent them, you know, maybe they would be ruined to a, to some extent by people talking about them constantly the way that people do about the Beatles. But I don't the know. Be- oh. They're just undeniable, and and this record is a is a fucking masterpiece. I said, yeah. I said, I said quite you know, uh, hyperbically that it's the best pop record of the 60s. It's probably not better than Pet Sounds, but it's 
fucking close. Like it's up on the same echelon for me as Pet Sounds, uh, a great album. And I will be listening to Arthur very soon. Yes, you will be. Yeah. So there's that. I, uh, I command you. And so that I think is going to be the peak of maybe anyone's enthusiasm for anything in this episode. And we're all, it's, it's all downhill from here. Although of course there are still some good records we have to talk about, but let's now plunge into the abyss go from a nine out of 10, a strong nine out of 10 record to a light one out of 10 record and talk about the new album from Jack Harlow. Mr. Oh, no. uh, yes. Mr. Louisville fuckboy himself. Uh, who I do not claim him. Who has, you know, risen through the ranks. Thank you to TikTok. Thank you to his co-sign by Lil Nas X. Thank you to his general, I guess, mannerisms and sort of beguiling enthusiasm and just generally like people like him. I've watched interviews with him. And he's very charming. He's very funny at times as well. Like he knows how to make a good impression. He can be cloying to a certain extent as well. Like if you watch any interview of him that in, where there's a woman present, you instantly see that he is just like, he, he, he's, he's being led by his dick in, in every fucking you know, thing that he sees and does. And he kind of gets away with it to a certain extent because he's very charming and he's very good at communicating. Have you seen the Dua Lipa thing yet? Well, what what (laughs) Dua Lipa specifically? He was talking about getting, he he called Dua Lipa to ask permission for it to be named. And then her response is like, I mean, I guess. Like, it was a response that basically (laughs) said everything other than I want you to die because you asked me this question. It has, that, that interaction has the same energy as when Kanye called Taylor Swift to okay the famous line. Um, <laughs> and um, because for context, for anyone who doesn't know, Jack Harlow called Dua Lipa to get her okay because he has a song on this new record called Dua Lipa that features a line, uh, something about Dua Lipa, I'm trying to do more with her than just a feature. <laughs> Uh, and what's funny that is, is that such little dick energy. What's funny is that that's the refrain of the song, and the rest of the song has nothing to do with Dua Lipa. It's just that one line that he says a few times, and the rest of the song is God knows what it's about. And that's a good way of summing up the entire record. Not only is this because if this were just boring, fine, I probably wouldn't talk about it as much. This is boring and offensively bad. This is like dollar store certified lover boy. And I mean, it, it makes that record look like an achievement, uh, you know, a, a positive achievement by comparison. And some, and it does that while being less than half the length of that record. This is insufferable. I mean, front to back, awful. Like you have the most like the most basic free trial DAS beats. Like you have the most like just absolutely completely personalityless rapping uh, there he jack harlow is a non-entity on his own album the entire time there is nothing that you can remember about this record it has a somewhat evocative title of come home the kids miss you and the whole album is about wanting to get pussy that's all it's about it's just about how much he wants to fuck how good he is at having sex uh and there's a couple of songs about how like the funniest moment is that like it's all about you know jack harlow's shallow interests and to some extent i get where he's at like he he recognizes that maybe he doesn't recognize, but I think on some level, he understands that he's in the middle of his 15 minutes and it's going to be over for him eventually, even though he deludes himself with the typical braggadocious songs about how he's coming up and he's going to be huge or whatever. And so to a certain extent, I can, I can understand like wanting to milk this moment for as much as it's worth, like wanting to sleep with as many celebrities as he can, wanting you to kind of like ride this out. But like, there's this moment but the whole record is about these most his most shallow ambitions to have sex or whatever and then there's like an occasional moment where he's like i get sad thinking about what will happen if my mom dies like (laughs) (laughs) and and then like there's that for like two seconds and then he just completely goes back into just found out about mortality damn girl that sucks on the mgk album where he like shouts out his dad after like after that one terrible line (laughs) The song's about my dead dad, but anyway. It's about as good as the MGK album, but I would happily pick the MGK album easily 
No, the MGK is actually is better than this. It's got things you can remember about it. It's got something, you know, tangible, like an idea of, of an artistic presence that he wants to be, uh, even if it all sounds terrible. This is just like, God, it's awful. It's awful. It's so bad. You know, I was- Fringy, um, soft boy, white dude rapping in 2022. It is lo-fi hip hop beats to harass women too. It is what we're selling. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 I don't, I will never think about it again. He, he, he brings shame on Kentucky. And, and, you know, not that the Kentucky is short of things to do that, but, you know. Yeah, because we needed, had, we really needed another slid. thing. <laughs> anyway, that's all, that's what I've been listening to. Brett, what have you been listening to recently? Some of the highlights of your listening that you want to shout out. I guess, like, the, uh, what I'll start off with is um, this album right here, which I just recently got on vinyl. Oh, Adrian oh, Lincoln. Songs by... Adrian yes. Link, yes. Yeah, so um, I uh, recently had the pleasure of seeing Big Thief live on uh, uh, this week. It, it was one of the best concerts I've ever seen in my life. And just to prepare for that, I was I, I've been meaning to listen to Adrian's solo stuff, um, just because I've heard every Big Thief album up until then. So I just needed something else to check out. So um, I listened to songs, and um, yeah, uh, this might be my favorite folk album. Um, I'm not sure it's like this is coming from a big Elliot Smith fan. I just like every song on this every song on this album is just absolutely perfect and what I really like about songs is that it has this really interesting atmosphere to it where like you kind of feel like you're outside. Um, I'm not sure if she recorded a lot of these songs outside but like at the end of songs you can hear things like like cars passing on a freeway or like you'll hear like a fly like buzzing in your ear and it has this like really interesting like natural or like natural quality to it like it's somehow like connected with like something supernatural but um yeah every song on here is perfect um it's a 15 out of 10 for me uh, but yeah that's uh, that's probably the best thing that i listened to this week I, um, I would agree with your take that it's my favorite folk record as well i think adrian is at a point in her career that's somewhat analogous to where Joni mitchell was in 1971 in the sense that like this is probably the most important female voice of her, her niche putting out the best music of her career and like songs is a record where like like the first time you listen to it you're like this is a great collection of folk songs and the more you listen to it the more you realize that like they might as well be the only folk songs that have ever been recorded because you just don't Absolutely. there's nothing in them that like there's nothing you could want from folk music that that album doesn't deliver in some form. It's emotional. It's heart wrenching. It's beautiful. It's uplifting. It's gorgeous. It has like some of the, uh, I hate talking about Adrian and big thief to some extent, because I feel like I just have no way of coherently doing it without just lapsing into the most hyperbolic language possible. But I just, it's, it's, it's the, she brings it out of me, man. I fucking. Yeah. I, I would be yeah, like this this album this album really like maybe just fall in love with her more because I've I've always admired her songwriting but like this just makes you feel so much closer to her and it just feels such a, like a personal album um yeah like when I was listening to this I it was just on repeat like I, I listened to this thing like two or three times I want to say just on repeat um it's just got such a, a beautiful flow to it and um yeah it just has some of the like best guitar playing like that I've heard it she, she's just amazing um but um what I'll go on to next is that um this week um like kind of every week I just kind of dive into um an artist that I haven't really finished their discography or like they're just a huge blind spot for me um so this week that artist is Aphex Twin so um I've already Ooh. listened to um I actually uh, have two of his albums on vinyl this is actually my favorite one the Richard uh the Richard D. James album. Great pick. And so I gave that a listen this week. And um, I just decided to just just pretty much just tackle all of his biggest albums that I haven't listened to. Um, I still have yet to listen to um, uh, Saw 2 or um, Because I Care You Do. Um, what I did listen to this week was uh, Drugs, um, his last or second to last album that he made. And uh, it, for me, this was... Uh, 
interesting. It's a bit of a mixed bag for me, just because on, on one hand, this has some of the like most like boundary pushing, like frenetic, like drill and bass music that I've ever heard. And like sandwiched in between each songs are like these interesting like ambient or like electronic piano. Yeah, exactly. You'll play piano on some. It'll be like this kind of interesting, like atmospheric experiments that he'll do. Um, but the, the songs that I uh, that I really enjoyed are just the songs where it's just completely just full throttle drill and bass nonsense. It, it's it's fucking awesome. And um, what I, what kind of actually made me listen to this album was um, my my good friend Seth actually showed me the video for uh, Rubber Johnny, which I believe is the song. Yeah, it's, I think it's like the AFX twenty three something. Um, yeah, that classic. video is, yeah, that that video is like one of the most like, <laughs> like excitingly terrifying things that I've ever seen in my life. It's it's a, a must. Cunningham video. I, I yeah, think he, so. multiple Chris Cunningham videos. So there's also the Come to Daddy video and the Window ah, Licker yeah. video that Cunningham did as well. But Rubber Johnny is like, Rubber Johnny is also the name of the creature that appears in the uh, Oh Come yeah, Daddy I remember video. This now. Um, but yeah, the thing oh, about okay. Aphex Twin is that if you want to like experience like or consume Aphex Twin, you cannot ignore the music videos and like the visual media that accompany oh, yes. the bigger stuff because that's yes. such a big part of like what Aphex Twin was in the nineties. So yeah, um, uh, just yeah, bizarre. Yeah, yeah, he's he's got such a, a knack for making like the the wackiest shit, um, but. Yeah, I, I, I really want to get down to like the rest of his discography, but um, overall, I, I really enjoyed the album, um, even though it's a, a huge, huge mission to complete, like with 30 songs, like an hour and a half long. And some of the times it's just really like almost like overwhelmingly um, like just like frenetic and just like spastic at some points. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Another thing that I listened to was a new album from the Japanese punk band uh, Oto Boke Beaver. Um, oh, I yeah. think that's how you say their name. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so their album Super Champon uh, came out. And <laughs> look, you have to listen to this album if you haven't. It is so good. It's some of the most fun punk music that I've ever heard. Um, I mean, if you're a fan of the, uh, the Giocho album that came out this year, if you're a fan of stuff like uh, like Trico, even um, it has something that's similar to that, but it's got it's got such a just like fun, just so lively and like it's so technically precise too. They they do such a good job with like switching rhythms and um, just doing so much in such a short amount of time too. Because um, this is a it, it's a long album, it's 18 songs, but in overall length it's 22 minutes. So the longest song on here is like two minutes long and there's songs on here that are like 15 seconds like 20 seconds so they they do some pretty interesting stuff and they fit a lot in 22 minutes that you you didn't think that a band could do but i love um, highly uh, highly recommend that one i love the title Um, of the uh 13th track on this record which is 18 seconds long and called you're no hero shut up fuck you man whore (laughs) yeah and that's one of the best songs on there. It's Real so good. Shit. I really love their last album, so I, I really want to check this yeah, out. Yeah, same. I love like, that there's two 10-second songs on here called Do You Want Me to Send a DM? And Do You Want Me to Send a DM Part 2? <laughs> that's funny. That's very funny. Yeah, there, that out. album is absolutely great. Leave me great. alone. No, stay with me. <laughs> yeah, the, the song titles itself are great. But yeah, absolutely check that out it is a must listen all right well on that note let's get into our first review of the day which is of course the new album from sharon van etten we are all inside now something like we are all going to the world's fair yeah <laughs> yep that's that's the one uh we are we are the world we are the children something like that welcome to the black parade uh, that's the one we're going Imagine to by we're, we're, john lennon we're all going to uh do this wrong or something like that anyway we're, we're all welcome going, to hell by black Nitty. we've been we're going all, about this all wrong no i think we're on the right track jake i just can't think of what it's called i'm gonna fucking kill myself <laughs> Anyway, um, <laughs> Sharon Van Eaton, legendary indie singer-songwriter and producer as well. 
Uh, she has she garnered a lot of acclaim early in her career with very minimal, stripped down, but quite haunting and emotional records such as Epic and Tramp. Records where she would kind of detail in abstract but haunting ways the you know awful experiences that she went through in her 20s, abuse that she suffered and, and the difficult life that she had. And her voice has always been so compelling such that even the minimal and very stripped down approaches of those early records where you don't have a super large amount of stuff going on musically was always captivating because of her voice. And I think in with uh, 2014's Are We There, Sharon kind of found a way to take her voice and kind of kind of bring the soundscapes that she was working with and bring the songwriting that she was working with to a new level. Uh, Are We There is a lush, gorgeous album. I remember it was one of the records that I listened to the most in 2014 that came out that year. Has some of her best songs on it still. Uh, including the amazing uh, Your Love Is Killing Me, Tarifa. Gorgeous album, one that still holds up. She then decided to step away for a while. She became a mother and she sort of lived her life for a little bit and then came back in 2019 with the fantastically underrated Remind Me Tomorrow, an album that dropped in January of that year. And so it felt like people kind of forgot that it happened to a certain extent after a while. But I remember that fucking thing coming out because I listened to that album a lot. Uh, when it came out, I said instantly, this is her best record. And I still feel that way. It features um, some of her best songs on it. Jupiter 4, 17, which was a huge song when that came out. An absolutely gut-punching, rip-roaring song. And then, so, so Sharon's been, I think, an artist that I've always felt like she has a masterpiece under her belt and remind me tomorrow felt like she was getting closer towards that than ever and this new record we've been going through this all wrong i'm never going to get that album title right i'm sorry but this new record uh and it's interesting because the rollout for this album is interesting because there wasn't really one it wasn't a surprise release she announced it about a month ahead of time, but she decided she didn't want to release any singles. And pointedly, not just because she didn't like the whole hullabaloo of, of single after single rollout, but also because and she was very explicit about this. She believed this was a record you had to experience in its entirety and you had to spend time with and you had to kind of consider as a holistic package. And when I listened to it this week, I began gradually to understand why that is i don't think that there's been an album this year that has benefited the most for me for living with it and and actually letting it kind of soak in as much as this album has when i first heard it i was uh, frankly underwhelmed i thought it had a couple of really good songs but for the most part it was kind of just sort of stagnating through these very sort of atmospheric but kind of groundless uh compositions and to a certain extent, I mean, that is true. It is a very atmospheric record. It's a very kind of weightless record at points. But listening to this thing over and over again, particularly late at night and early in the morning as well, and particularly with good headphones, this album has really snuck up on me. Uh, I'm still not quite at the point where I would put it over Remind Me Tomorrow, but I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of the year, I do feel that way. Because I think this is an album, this is, I hate using words like mature to describe records because Sharon doesn't need her record to be described as mature. It's condescending, frankly, to an artist who's always been very uh, elegant and composed in her writing. But this feels like compositionally and musically, Sharon has approached uh, a new level of refinement and sophistication that to me demonstrates an artist who is making some of the most interesting and rewarding music of their entire career. And also, I'm just going to be up front, this is the best sounding album of the year so far from a pure engineering standpoint. Uh, hats off, this was self-produced. Sharon produced this record by herself in her home studio. She had the help of uh, mixing and mastering engineers to kind of ma make it what it was by the end of it. But this is, I think, an absolute masterclass in sound engineering for music. If you want to learn how to engineer a record, if you want to learn what makes 
uh, how to make an indie rock record sound like it is a stadium rock record in terms of how to make like basic atmospheric ambient textures sound like, you know, the most adrenaline pumping shit in the world somehow. This is what I would point you towards. Um, the feeling that the sound of this gives me uh, is weirdly not dissimilar to like the last Death Heaven record. Like it sounds very little like it, but in terms of like how lush and huge these soundscapes are and the way I get kind of wrapped and pulled up into them, it was not similar to my experience with Infinite Granite. The artist I thought a lot of while listening to this, and this is certainly because they had collaborated together in the past. They put out a song together last year, Angel Olsen. I thought of Angel Olsen a lot yep. while listening to this, particularly yep. like kind of both my woman and all mirrors in the sense that it has the kind of intimacy and kind of close to the mic uh personal tone of my woman but it also has the kind of grandeur at points and scale that all mirrors frequently has too but this is altogether a much more insular record than either of those in terms of tone and subject matter it is a pandemic record but thankfully it's not you know, a pandemic record. It's just a record that where the songs reflect the sort of state that Sharon has been going through, um, that we've all been going through, ah, wrong. Uh, it reflects the kind of emotional state that she's been in, but it benefits from the fact that the lyrics have a certain level of, of abstraction to them. That again, is a kind of characteristic of Sharon's writing, but I think it's even more abstract here than it has been in the past, such that Sharon communicates a feeling more than a particular scene or setting or story. And I think it, the music and the album and its effect benefits all the more from that. It is a set of songs that are very atmospheric, that are very kind of lifted above the ground with lyrics that are equally kind of unfixed as well. And as a result of that, it's a record that will either land for you or it will leave you adrift. Uh, maybe, you'll grow, maybe it'll grow on you, maybe it won't. But um, I kind of steamrolled in here as I sometimes do well often do just because my last listen to this this morning was transformative and um I look I don't think it's you know her best record I'm not quite fully you know uh shut, ready to shut from the rooftops that it's one of the best albums of the year but I think it's a record that deserves a certain level of love that it's just not getting frankly because of the understated nature of how it was released and because it's released the same day as Arcade Fire, and we've got all these other huge releases that are happening that are just swallowing conversation compared to this. And I think that is a shame because this is a beautiful record that has some of Sharon's best songs and has a sense of patience where if you're willing to get on its level, it will sit you down and kind of stare into your eyes and it will speak to you directly. And it, you have to be an artist on Sharon's caliber with Sharon's level of experience to be able to do that. And it's a real treat, I think. And I, yeah, I, I've just come to really love it in a way that I wasn't expecting to when I first heard it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a special album that I'm glad we're getting to formally review in a month that's so stacked with great records or with records that we get to talk about that are big and high profile. Yeah, I really can't fault anything Riley is saying just because I definitely came away from this very positively. I I also listened to her last album and admittedly, I probably need to revisit her past work just because anything I did listen to her, I, just none of it ever really stayed with me in the same way a lot of other singer-songwriter singer stuff does. But I was still excited to check this out. Um, especially after I heard the first song on here, which is Darkness Fades, which is head and shoulders my favorite song on here. I love this song. It's got this intimate echoing opener. It's about a renewed sense of intimacy that really gains momentum with some thunderous drums that come in and are just insanely dense instrumental arrangement that Sharon's vocals actually rise to meet. The, the mix here is so dense. And the mix on most of the songs here are really dense, but without being overwhelming or cluttered. I have to only co-sign the just mixing on this as being nothing short of immaculate for the most part. That's absolutely gorgeous. 
the record never really hits another high point like this for me, but it manages to stay a really consistent course from here on out, mainly because of the fact that Sharon is a great lyricist, I think. Um, like, Home to Me, for example, I really like, she kind of ekes out these melodies combined with the piano on here actually makes me think of early era Nick Cave, like the good son, if it was a little bit more tasteful. And that's another word I would use to describe this album is just kind of tasteful. It really reminds me of, I think I would say that the last time uh, an album had this much dedication to its slightly quieter, more atmospheric moments was, I mean, it would probably be Punisher or something that Sean Everett had a hand in making. Just something that is really rewarding to audiophiles to listen to. Um, it's, it's a, uh, Home to Me is a very good song, but it does have a kind of, the steady electronic drums here do sound a bit rigid and dry compared to how active and moving everything else sounds. Um, I also really like the somber outro to the song as well. And, you know, I'll Try has a bit more heft. It's got these bright, let's see, grandma style synths. Uh, anything is incredibly lyrically captivating. It shows its subject that it's most vulnerable. It's where the writing of the album connects with me the most, but simultaneously they're most weathered as well. It has a really great instrumental climb, a really great structure. Um, I really love the arresting set of lyrics on Born or the distorted guitar opening of something like Headspace contrasting with her really fragile sounding vocals. It's, uh, it kind of sounds slow dive-esque as a matter of fact. And hell, even when she hits the higher octaves with her voice on this song, she actually sounds a little bit like FKA Twigs, surprisingly. Um, come back, lyricism here is really expressionistic and vivid. It's not exactly anything new for the album that it's been kind of finding a steady middle ground of variations upon the same kind of sound. And here is one of the only parts where it doesn't exactly feel like that deviation yields anything if the deviation is a deviation at all but i i like darkish well enough but i think it's probably my least favorite song here just because it's stripped back and a bit repetitive um but the vocals and lyricism still remain compelling and that's sort of the core fundamental of this album is that even though there are songs i like a lot less than the high points is that it never ever veers into being anything other than solid in those fundamentals um, the only other real gripe I have with the record is that I just think it ends significantly weaker than it starts. I think Far Away is fine, but I'm not really in love with her vocal intonation when it comes to the higher notes that she hits here. And that kind of comprises the vast majority of the song. It sort of kind of ends before it gets going. It's a little underwhelming. So it makes the second half fall a bit flat in that like final leg. And just because it is so consistently fundamentally solid, I just can't help but feel like this is definitely another album of hers. That's, uh, on, it's, it's a pretty damn good album. It's on the journey of like, she's almost to greatness by my ears, but she's not quite there yet, maybe. I'm, I could totally disagree with myself and listen to some of her earlier projects and find them more compelling, but I think this is the most immediate sounding thing she's made, even though it does require, I think, a bit of patience to fully appreciate, but I, I did really like it. It's just something that feels like it could end up being transitional if Sharon takes a bigger leap as an artist from this point forward. Okay, uh, well, I, uh, I'll go into this. Um, yeah, so this is my first uh, kind of experience with Sharon Van Etten. Um, I've been aware of her for a while now. Um, I've just never really gotten the chance to check out her music. Um, I just, my, my ADHD ass just gets in too many people. But um, it, it was a good thing that she actually came out with a new album this year because I, I had been meeting to listen to her music and also Angel Olsen's music, who I really yes. should check out. Honestly, uh, I came away from this album um, at first, when I listened to it, I, quite frankly, I thought it was really on, I guess, like, I guess, I guess the best word I could just say it was quite boring. It didn't really grab my attention. Um, I thought that some of her vocal presence on the songs didn't really catch me. Um, but recently, this album has really, really grown on me. Um, today, actually, this album, I was listening to it just to prepare for this. And a lot of songs just started clicking with me. The first two songs, I will admit, I'm still not completely sold on. Um, I do think the instrumentals are great. And the production, as you guys mentioned, are it's fantastic. I had no idea she produced this to herself. It makes me even like that even more. 
Um, mm-hmm. But I guess um, still, I guess on the, the first track, I guess I just find her vocal presence to just be, I don't know, just kind of not really attention grabbing. I, I just kind of find myself zoning out a little bit with that song. I don't even quite remember, frankly, how it goes. But from there, um, I, I would say that like from I'll Try to, to Come Back is honestly probably one of the best stretches of music I've heard this year. Um, just because the way that she's kind of produced this in a way where it's very grand and like very lush, like um, like on a song like Come Back, how it just builds to this really great uh, like crescendo. And, you know, the, the vocals just sound louder and she sounds like more like passionate and awake. Um, my, my favorite song on here, I, like head and shoulders here is Headspace. Um, I've just been really connecting with this song just because um, just her her vocal delivery on this song is just absolutely enticing. And just the, the way that the production again builds on this is it's absolutely captivating. It's um, it's one of the best pop songs I've heard of the year. And um, there's other great moments on here too, where um, I kind of lean towards the more favorable like synth pop side, like uh, like songs like, like Mistake. Um, yeah, I was going to say, no one's like shouted Ultra. that out yet. That's a fucking yeah. huge standout, I think, on this album. It, it is so good. It's one of the best bangers I've heard this year. It's, it's so good. Um, and yeah, like it, same thing with something like I'll Try, you know, anything is great too. Um, Born has uh, a really cool, um, uh, I really like her vocal uh, presence on that too, how she kind of goes into the higher register uh, on that song. You know, the ending song is a little bit of a bummer for me. Um, I thought it was a little bit too short of a song to end this album on, um, especially because you have a lot longer songs that kind of build with, you know, great effect to, you know, songs like Headspace or Come Back. Um, I, I just thought Far Away was um, a little bit of a weird note to, to end the album on. Um, but but generally, I, I came away from this album really pleasantly surprised, especially the the kind of you know roller coaster that I've had with this album, um, kind of you know, like figuring out whether I really liked it or I just didn't really catch my attention. Um, but you know, just kind of re-listening to it, it, it really is one of those albums where you kind of just really have to pay attention to it um, because I had a I had a fairly busy week this week. I didn't get a chance to dive into any of the lyrics or anything like that. Um, I only really um, got a sense of some of the lyrics on Headspace um, just because I, I really like the refrain, how she says, like, um, I just want to be ageless. Um, I just want to be uh, I, I just want to be here. I just love how she expresses that on that song. Um, but, you know, this album is um, it's still pretty good. I, I think it's fantastically produced um, and it makes me want to check out more of her stuff. I, I came away from this album uh, actually pleasantly surprised. Yeah, I um, I won't take away from the critique of of the closing track because like individually as a song it is a little bit of a lesser moment but I think the reason why it doesn't bother me is again as I don't I understand if if this is not just not how people think of of albums all the time necessarily but I do very much see this like Sharon says as a single sort of holistic piece where you have these ebbs and flows and it's sort of less about individual songs I think that's part of the reason why the the broad palette of music is so similar across these songs and that will lend this to blur together for some listeners for sure but uh the less substantive individual moments i think make more sense as uh well in the case of the closing track here as a kind of resolution in the wake of the sort of more loud and aggressive mistakes but I think that's the the context in which I have learned to appreciate songs like darkish as well which is still my least favorite moment here but i think in a in context between the kind of heavy and intense vocal of, of comeback and the the much more sort of pop centric structure of mistakes works as a piece of kind of connective tissue fairly well um but yeah anyway i have some more thoughts but i'll save them morgan i know that uh, Aisha, are you a sharon van etten fan i feel like you are but i don't think we've talked about her that much i am like an admirer there are mm-hmm like 10 or so songs that I really like from her, but I've honestly never listened to an album all the way through. I don't really have a reason for that. I uh, really love the song she did with Angel Olsen last year. Was that this year? That was last year, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that, that that was great. I got pretty into the rollout for Remind Me Tomorrow. And then <laughs> it just, I didn't, I then I didn't listen to it. And I think what happened there is that the album, album art was released and I was like, oh, 
it's, that, a, that's, it's, a, it's a miss. That, yeah. That's hideous. <laughs> that just kind of moved on. But yeah, 17 off of that album is like one of the best singles of that era, maybe of the whole decade. So yeah, definitely a casual fan uh, of Sharon Van Etten. And really that trend continues with this album. I liked it. It sounds great, but I sort of, parts of it kind of washed over me and the parts of it that I did enjoy were sort of passive. Uh, Nothing really grabs me here like 17 did or a song like uh, Every Time the Sun Comes Up, uh, Serpents. Those are real, real heavy hitters of hers. Um, nothing on here really grabs me like any of those do. That I think that's really more of a fault with th- what I look for with this brand of singer-songwriter, indie rock type of stuff, and less to do with the album itself. So yeah, I think it's good. I just didn't fully, I just didn't really connect. Fair enough. Um, the thing about previous Sharon records, I think, leading up to up to but not including Remind Me Tomorrow is that my biggest issue with her records before then was that, again, they're very front-loaded. Like Tramp is a front-loaded record. I think three of the best songs that, you know, three absolutely fucking fantastic songs in the first half of that record and Give Out, Leonard and Serpents, uh, particularly Give Out, which is still my favorite song she's ever released. Uh, and then uh, Are We There, incredibly front-loaded record, still very good on the whole, but all the highlights, uh, with a, uh, the exception of the closer, I suppose, are in the front half. Your Love Is Killing Me, Tarifa, Our Love, uh, Taking Chances, like amazing, amazing songs in the first half of that record. And then Remind Me Tomorrow was the first moment where I felt like Sharon figured a, a better way of balancing the, her best moments and kind of creating a record that flowed a bit better from front to back. And the thing about those three records is that they all have these highs that are astonishingly great. And the best moments on this record are admittedly not quite on the level of songs like 17, Your Love Is Killing Me, and Give Out. That said, I think this is front to back her most consistent and uh, unified and well-constructed album. I think that as a singular album experience, Sharon has done something that she hasn't done before on this level, which has really mastered the craft of how to put together a record where the best moments are well staggered, where you have this natural ebb and flow, where that it does feel like a single unified piece. And that made it a, made, has made it a really satisfying album to just put on, not pay any attention to what track I'm on, just put it on, uh, vibe out, do something, play a video game, read write and just feel transported that entire time and feel like i'm somewhere else uh, in a soundscape that i can actually navigate and feel like i'm inside of the album and um as much as i love angel olsen's all mirrors album and i do love that album it's fantastic my one quibble with that record was that john congleton was not the best choice of producer for it uh he's a great producer he's good he produces a lot of great indie rock records But for a record that wants to sound as fucking gigantic as All Mirrors does, those ambitions sometimes reach against the limits of Congleton's style of production. You get a little bit of distortion. You get a little bit of like roughness around the edges that I kind of wish that record didn't have. And so one of the reasons why I guess I've clicked so hard with We've Been Going About This All Wrong is that it's kind of what I wanted that record to sound like, how I wanted that record to be mixed. A song like Born on this, like the second half of the song, when it gets huge and the strings are enormous and it feels like it's going to fucking tear apart. But it doesn't sound like it's tearing apart. It sounds rich. It sounds fulsome. It doesn't sound like there's a cheapness or that you're kind of hearing a sort of brick wall or compression that takes away from the majesty of it. It's a real achievement. And I... I guess it must be really hard to make records sound like this or more records would, 
but it really scratched an itch where it's like, yes, you're, f- you're making it sound exactly the way that I wish so many records with this focus on being atmospheric and huge and spacious and loud actually could sound. She really hits that. And yeah, and, and Headspace is, I think I agree with Brett, that's my favorite song on the record. I think there's an intensity to it. I love the electronic production, the kind of more synthetic sounds to it. It adds a real weight to it. It almost has a kind of industrial tone, like somewhat yeah, uh, to a certain extent that I love. Um, other highlights have already been shouted out. The song Anything, I have listened to that so much this week. Like mm-hmm. that song just fucking, it's only two minutes and change, but it fucking levels me. I agree with Jake on the opener being stunning like just fucking flooring in terms of how beautiful it sounds uh mistakes i've had stuck in my head all week as well that hook is just like the thing about this record that i love the most is like this is a vocal showcase for sharon like more songs than not she's fucking hollering on this album she's just emoting and singing so hard that I get it could be too much for some people because she has this particular voice and tone that might not be for everyone. But man, is she landing these notes throughout these records on songs like Anything, on songs like uh, Headspace, on songs like Darkness Falls, on songs like Mistakes, where holy shit, her presence is just undeniable. And I um, think that even elevates some songs like Home to You and and, um, uh, Come Back that are like less compositionally accomplished, but are just so pushed into the stratosphere by her voice for me. And um, I do want to shout out um, the song, Anything in particular, which has my favorite lyric on the record, which is a line that is going to stay with me, I think, for the whole year, which is the line, uh, you love him by the stove light in your arms. He's there because he can't stand the sad eyes. Like such a, my kind of lyric, incredibly impressionistic, like this uh, idea, the stove light in your arms. This uh, It's a very evocative and kind of cryptic and almost sort of like surreal image. And, and the idea of uh, an attachment or of a connection to someone where you're reliant upon each other, but you can barely stare each other in the face because of what you see and what you're reminded of when you look at each other. And it's fucking devastating and the way that she just hammers on that line of i couldn't feel anything over and over and over again like the numbness uh, i think instinctively this is a song about being locked down right being locked down with a partner and just kind of the numbness of an unchanging existence where you aren't really you don't really get to have the freedoms that people need from their partner in any healthy relationship like that the, the ability to be on your own sometimes and do your own thing you don't have that and the song is about the numbness that sets in in that situation, in that circumstance. A uh, headspace is like, is really fun, or not fun, but it's really uh, interesting because like, it, it sounds super threatening when you listen to it. That refrain of baby, don't turn your back to me. Like it sounds like quite almost scary and like something portentous and, and dark is happening. But it's a song about the way she like the way she gets more ferocious on that song too. Like she starts super mellow, but then is screaming that by the end of the song. I love that. But yeah, and you hear that kind of intensity and it's quite affronting. And then you read into the lyrics and it's a song about being horny and like wanting to be intimate with your partner and like feeling as though you have to demand that because of the moment that you're experiencing. And like you have to, in a certain way, like put on this threatening front like the way she describes very sensual intimate encounters here are like it makes them sound so kind of aggressive i want to touch you in the dark put lips on neck to me hold yourself up against me don't stop pull my hips remind you see 10 year old white cotton briefs want to play like there's a sensuality there but there's like the way she sings it and the kind of heft and intensity like it's it's something, you know, and uh, if you are the kind of person who has an emotional reaction to powerful women, <laughs> let's just say, as I know some of us are, then it's a song that uh, will leave an impression. Let's just leave it at that. But um, yeah, no, I, I, I've, I've come to really love this record. I only think it'll grow on me more and more. And I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just glad we got to shout it out. I'm glad that Sharon got to do this. Okay. Well, on that note, favorite tracks and ratings for Sharon Van Etten's. When the Porn Hits the Conflicts. Jake, your favorite tracks and rating. 
favorite song on here is darkness fades and then i'll also say headspace and anything um least favorite track is far away and i give the album a very light seven okay uh morgan uh, i will say my favorite sir oh jesus uh anything uh darkness fades and mistakes uh least favorite um i will also say darkish not exactly you know it's the least essential moment i would say um and i will give this a six out of ten all right my favorite tracks are headspace anything and mistakes um oh, special shout out to born as well i really wanted to put that in there uh least favorite is darkish and the album gets a very strong 7.5 from me very close to an eight brett favorite song on here um headspace um also go with mistakes and i'll also say i'll try um man born was really close to being on there too for me but um yeah it's those three um least favorite uh, agreeably is darkish um, but I will give this a very, very strong seven out of 10. All right. So that means that we get an average of 6.9. Nice for Sharon Van Etten's. We've been going through this an awful lot and it's time to stop. The world is a beautiful place and I'm no longer afraid to die. Yes, exactly. With that, let's move on to our second review of the day. Really the main feature that I suspect a number of people are probably here for. Let's talk about it. Arcade Fire. So, I am going to save my actual thoughts on this record until after everyone else has spoken. But I will introduce the album and I'll give context as much as it is needed. Arcade Fire are probably one of the most legendary and beloved indie bands ever. In the 2000s, they were huge. They were beloved. They were anthemic. They were like, like you too, to some extent, but with less of the pretense and more of the just kind of hard on sleeve, you know, emotionality. And also like a kind of rough shot sort of garagey indie sound that made them kind of feel more intimate and connected to you. And yeah, just generally a band that any teenager, I think, would fall in love with particularly those first three records um but as arcade fire have gotten bigger as they've gotten more successful uh i think really like a big pivot point was when they released the suburbs in 2010s their third record which is a fantastic album widely beloved it's kind of their uh the river almost or like they're born in the usa or something like it's a it's a very like springsteen indebted like classic rock indebted in the album that has a lot of heart in it a lot of love in it a lot of a kind of very kind of ambitious concept and also was incredibly successful it won the grammy i think for best alternative album um and or maybe it was an album of the year even maybe it won a lot of grammys anyway or multiple grammys i'm pretty sure it was a huge deal for an indie band and it really crossed over and it's a record that still holds up to this day but it was it represented i think a moment a kind of tipping point moment in Arcade Fire's career where they are obviously a band, like even from their very early days, from their self-titled EP to Funeral, you can sense this ambition in this band. Like it's a band made up of a, you know, more than half a dozen people. They're playing their instruments super hard. They're hollering their hearts out. You can sense the ambition there. They want, they're a stadium sized band with the budget of an indie band and they're doing their fucking best. And that, is the appeal of the early music, I think, is, is that, you know, kitschy kind of like um, quality, that sense of, of you know, that you, they, you feel connected to them, I think. Well, at least I did anyway. But with the suburbs, with the success of that record, becoming a huge sort of stadium filling band, they continued to turn their ambitions outward in a number of different ways continue to, to expand their sound and also continuing to expand some of their thematic interests. Um, notably, their second record, which is the fantastic Neon Bible, is a fairly political record, 
but it's also grounded in a sense of like emotionality and, and personality in the songwriting that stops it from being unbearable. Um, I don't even think makes it remotely unbearable, frankly. It's a great album. But it's also kind of like there's a warning in there that Wynne Butler, Regine Chassan, however you say her name, the, the husband-wife couple uh, leading this band, you can sense they have some opinions and some thoughts and some feelings about our society that they want to speak on. And it wasn't really until, well, it wasn't really until 2016's Everything Now, but even before that, with 2013's Reflector, this is the moment where most Arcade Fire fans, well, like all Arcade Fire fans had to make a decision with Reflector, whether they jump ship or whether they follow this band into this want to be the biggest band in the world, you know, want to be the most important band in the world, you know, thing that they they were going for. And Reflector was very much like the watershed moment. Like it was the moment where it was the crossing the Rubicon, essentially, where Arcade Fire became a different band. They became the, this new Mark II iteration of Arcade Fire, where they were determined to be the biggest band in the world and to be the most important band in the world, to have the most to say. Now, Reflector wasn't so much topical in that sense, but there were definitely elements of that. It was more about the hugeness of the sound they went for on that record, the kind of disco influence, the electronic influence, the sort of eclectic sound of it. But it wasn't until 2017's Everything Now that Arcade Fire finally kind of crashed and burned, essentially. Like what they narrowly avoided doing with Reflector, which is a flawed record that nevertheless has some great songs on it. The, the, the fucking wheels came off with Everything Now, right? This was their you know, we live in a society record. It was one of a number of records uh, in the year 2017 where it was like, you know, post-Trump elected, you know, record about how, you know, fucking, you know, disillusioned we all are, how reliant on technology we all are, yada, 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 all that shit. And no one was having it. It was a complete flop, right? Critically, just completely crashed. Commercially, didn't lift off uh some of the worst singles they ever released uh i still have fucking fever dream nightmares about hearing signs of life for the first time which is and, and chemistry and fucking uh oh i mean the 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 title the title track on that record was kind of like a, a semi-decent kind of heartlandy abba-esque song that wasn't terrible but so much of that record is just like ill-advised aesthetic decision after ill-advised aesthetic decision including having two songs called infinite content with the refrain we have infinite content but are we infinitely content and so that was what happened to arcade fire in 2017 and so the response to that record was pretty universal they got the message people weren't into it but i think that arcade fire in some ways took away the wrong messages from everything now and the failure of that record what arcade fire took away was we were trying to be something that we're not musically we're trying to be too big we need to strip back we need to go back to the intimate sound that people fell in love with us for but what they didn't do is well, what they have done essentially is they have made a record that's more intimate. They have made a record that deliberately echoes their early albums to the point where you have like drum motifs and like vocal melodies and stuff that are deliberately kind of shamelessly calling back to early material. And you have all of this couched within this concept of, so like everything now was for the Trump election, what this album is for the post pandemic era where it's all about how connected we are while not being connected. Uh, there's this conceptual framework this album is couched in. I just love how dead Jake's expression is right now. Just completely, completely lost all will to live. But there's this conceptual framework of this album where it, how they constructed it was, it starts off where it's songs about the individual, I, and it gradually uh, transitions into being songs about the collective, we. And so you have this conceptual journey the album takes you on from being isolated and alone to being a part of a community. That's what they're trying to do here. 
it is i think the shortest album they've ever put out 40 minutes flat and um that's what it is you know that's what it's all about that's what they're trying to do and how that manifests i will leave people who are maybe not more angry than me but certainly as angry maybe as i am and maybe less emotionally connected to discuss and enlighten us with um Jake, you're, you're moving the laptop closer to your face in, in anticipation. I know what's coming. What did this album, how did, what was your experience going into this album? What were your expectations and what was your experience like listening to Arcade Fire? What did this today? album do to you? Show me oh. on the doll where the album touched you. If I had a doll, I would. Um, see, okay. You listeners, podcast mates, all involved, feel free to discount my opinion entirely because I need to front run this with, I don't really care about Arcade Fire. That's not to say they're a band I dislike. They're just never a band I've gotten on the wavelength with just because I've only listened to Neon Bible. I I, I won't lie. I just haven't heard their other albums, which honestly, I'm sure I'm going to like because Cards on the Table, I love Neon Bible. I think that's a great album. I, there are so many songs there. When I first discovered music, that was an album that I started listening to, and I have very fond memories associated with it the summer I st- started listening to it. So I knew what the reputation was of the first couple albums and how they fell off with Reflector and then fell off harder with everything now. So I, I feel like their narrative as a band has kind of culturally run its course and just kind of missed me. So I haven't felt the necessity to get into them yet, despite the fact that they have a very big reputation. And I'm sure one day I will listen to those albums. And I'm sure I'm probably going to listen to them and like them a great deal. Hell, I'll probably list, re-listen the Neon Bible soon and think that album's even better than I used to think it was. I don't know. So I go into this... I, I don't have a precedent for this. I just go into it knowing what their last album was. And I was like, you know what though? I'm going to give them a fair shot because when you do something like make a fucking Trump election album, that is so far left field of a good idea that you just kind of, it's doomed. It's doomed. No matter how good your music is, you are basically resigning yourself to have a useless culturally artifact record that's that's just if it's not full of some of the best music you've ever made you might as well not even make it so i was like fine they're they're here now it's been how many years yeah, and they've made it in the past. yeah let's 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 give them another go and this album, you know, it's Got not intimidating. Me. It's not that many songs long. It's 40 exact minutes. And it's mostly comprised of a set of sweets. And so, okay. If we discount the Machine Gun Kelly album, which we didn't have a formal segment for, but we did talk about in one episode of this, this is the worst album I've heard this year that we've had a main dedicated segment on. Uh, and even if it wasn't the worst, even if it was a slightly better album, I would still hate it more than most other albums. And I think it's because it's because of a number of things. The first thing is that this is, you know, this is a post pandemic album. And I feel like we have been tired of this since we started this podcast. Like this has been an idea that we have been saying, stop doing this for three years now so that's not exactly a great starting point but i guess the problem for me here is is that the way this album is written if you didn't really tell me that I'm not sure I would have inferred it because the writing is so colorless, so devoid of personality, so abandoned of specifics of, of character that the vague ideas of, of unity or, or perseverance or whatever, they're barely fucking here. 
the fact that this is a post pandemic album, it barely means anything just because it, it doesn't anchor itself to any one specific idea. And yeah, it would probably be cringier or, or more embarrassing if they were trying to be more topical, if they were trying to lean farther into this aspect of the album. But it ends up being an album that's about fucking nothing for all 40 minutes of it. They're just vaguely shouting about whatever the fuck. It and would have been better if we had a song about like uh, binge watching Tiger King. <laughs> I mean, like, really, if this went into the, like, then we would have fucking um, uh, OK Human, which not an album I have that much affinity for, but I can at least respect the fact that Rivers Cuomo, for as dumb as a motherfucker as he is and as bad of a songwriter as he's become, had the decency to be able to back up the concept of his record with specifics. It's not that hard. And here... You have this element, right, where every single song or hook is just this vaguely inspirational, airless nothing. And then you combine it with the fact that this album is nauseatingly dedicated to sounding exactly like its three or four influences that it has no personality, none. Every single song I can chart the DNA of, like I'm a walking 23 and me machine. Every single fucking song is trying to sound like Bowie, trying to sound like Talking Heads, trying to sound like Bruce Springsteen, trying to sound like The Killers. And it just fucking sucks, especially because apparently... Did you say that Nigel Godrich engineered this, Riley? He, he was, they did hire him to produce this record, yes. Well, he did a bad fucking job because <laughs> most of the songs here are, the vocals are suffocated beneath this bland, boring, big sounding production where I have to be like, huh? You could listen to this. Say? You could listen to this album twelve times and still have no idea that Peter Gabriel is on it. Oh, oh, we'll get to that. From I mean, you know what? I won't even say that I got off on a wrong foot with this album because I definitely did because of the fucking album cover, which you look at, it's just like, oh, this looks fine. But it's just like, once you consider what the album's doing, it's like, it's an eye, like, you know, like the film Blade Runner, which is a dystopia. It has lots of eyes in it. It's like the eye from the movie Blade Runner. That's exactly the, the, the kind of vibe I'm getting from Butler and Co. here. And of course, of course, we have an album like this that begins with a song, not just a song, no less, a suite called Age of Anxiety. Oh, thank God. I'm so in glad the that age they heard it. In the in the age age of... It is Can I get the spirit out of me. Specific. This anxiety. It's it's from anxiety. the moment it starts, it desperately, desperately is trying to invoke Bowie. These songs that are all about now and that they mention TV and how the fucking, pills don't work. The fucking on plastic them. soul they, refrain in part two of the song. Oh, oh boy, I'll That's get you. to that. That's, That's literally needs, you. This needs to be tossed in a fire. Steven Wilson circa 2007, when Butler is not. I'm tired of hearing about how the pills don't work. I'm tired about hearing about TV bugs you, about how we live in the moment or whatever the I fuck. Mean, who's what, tired who's of fucking it. complaining about TV anymore? Like that's so outdated of a fucking cheesy society thing to complain about anyway. The only thing that could make it the only thing that could make it worse is if he was specific and talked about streaming. Instead, I feel like Wynn Butler has been like marooned on an island and hasn't absorbed culture for the past 15 years. I mean, one of the about lyrics- television, like we all watch Survivor. One of the like, lyrics on this living, song is um, born into the abyss, new phone, who's this? Like new phone, who this is like a meme from five years ago, at least like 10, maybe. I'm shocked. I'm shocked you could pinpoint a lyric on this song that isn't living in the age of 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 come dead boy or something like it's it's just so outdated. All it does. I could at least admire that. It sounds like bland electronic new agey shit. It's boring. And then you have the fucking lyric, the lost alien arriving on my spaceship of anxiety. Great lyric, dude. I too have listened to the band Radiohead and the album OK Computer. Wow, you're so fucking good. Fucking pat on the back. It sucks. 
fucking you're totally you're totally Bowie now, circa 1990. You're, you've done it. And also, just the dance beat drop in the in the final segment of this song sucks fucking ass. It sounds awful. And then, of course, you segue seamlessly into the age of anxiety too, which is this minimal opening with piano and lilting vocals that are just again desperately trying to be Tom York on Kid A. God, this beat sounds like dry ass. Father in heaven is sleeping. Somebody delete me. Hardy ha ha. Chinese throwing star. Lamborghini Countach. Maserati sports car. What is supposed to be compelling about the central idea of this song? Because it doesn't have one. Everything exists on the outside. It's all just this, it, it's, you can see right through it. There's no core to this part of the record here. The synths are ugly and squeaky and still sound, they, they drown out the struggling vocals, the anodyne lyrics to the point of annoyance where the drums also sound hollow and God, everything here just sounds, stay it with me kids, tinny, tinny. and hollow. Tinny. What the fuck is this? Oh, good. Another one of a song, these songs that comes out in a post-2020 album telling me to wake up, literally using the words wake up. Which the is also the, the name end. of one of their best and most canonical songs on funeral. You dare to evoke the song that was my fucking ringtone for three years in high school in the context of this fucking limp dick bullshit. Go fuck yourself. The synths at the end of this song sounds like you put the Vangelis synths from Blade Runner through a filter that's sole purpose was to suck out the warmth and definition of any given sound. Like it's supposed to be going through the process of THX 1138. Start doing some vocal shit where he tries to invoke David Byrne, but the instrumental just fucking suffocates the vocals to the point where you can barely tell what he's saying. The ending goes for this grand orchestral sweep and this plinky ass synth that just feel totally at odds with each other, but I guess it's the most definitive sonic idea they've had on the album so far. And then you get to end of a fucking empire and oh yay, another beginning that desperately tries to invoke the minimal piano led radio head tune circa fucking hail of the thief it's, it's sail of the moon it's fucking pyramid song it's the same fucking thing spent half your life being sad truly this is the band's lyrical peak oh but this is also actually supposed to be things that would be helpful to know before the revolution by father john misty if the song was robbed of all the wit and self-awareness and you're singing a song about the end of the american empire oh cool man fuck you what does that even mean here at the end of the movie? Motion picture soundtrack invoking. Good job, pal. Anytime he's not trying to actively raise his voice in this song, he is smothered by the production. I can't hear him over these dramatic how to disappear completely strings. Isn't this song more suited to be at the end of the album anyway? Just structurally yeah, speaking, so wouldn't you weird, think this would be a good... Is. Right? Like, you'd think it would be a good climactic ending, especially considering how anticlimactic the actual ending is. I don't know why this is here. I don't know. I, I just have to ask what is relevant about anything being said here. This could have come out the exact same year as Neon Bible, and because of how vague it is, it would be exactly as relevant. End of an umpire. End of an umpire. End of an empire for I unsubscribe. I unsubscribe. She Once again, we have yet we unsubscribe. We have a oh, of course, we have multiple unsubscribing here. You have posted cringe. This just it's it's another Bowie Radiohead combo. The lyric, the the best part about this song is that the we in we're in the lyric sheet is capitalized. Do you get it? Because the album is also called We. Do you get that? The vocal refrain of unsubscribe on here is so maddening. I felt like I was trying to, like, they were lulling me into a, like, Alex DeLarge, like, fi like brainwashing state where, like, I'm going to turn into the guy who got obsessed with Jodie Foster or something, and I'm just going to go and, like, kill a random musician and tell me catcher and the rye told me to. And then there's, there's the, the moment on the album where nothing is good, but it's just less annoying with the lightning one and the lightning two the production still smothers the vocals the instrumental tension here on the other hand is at least present 
the lyrics are decently impressionistic without ha- sacrificing how vivid they are. It sounds like a C plus killer song, so it's fine. I'm not a fan of the vocals. The production woes aside, it is an average song, which is to say it is easily the best thing on here. The Lightning 2 has a jaunty little opening, a sanitized instrumental, but it still has a little bit of energy, continuing with the Killers and Springsteen slash bizarre Bright Eyes circa Casadega kind of thing going on. It kind of works, but my God, all I can think about is how much better Casadega is and how much better it sounds and how much better of a lyricist Connor Oberst is. And his vocal breaking and lilting sounds exactly like Connor Oberst here. Like, holy shit, did you, like, it felt like they got him for a fucking feature, exactly like him. And that is to say, this is the second best song on the album, and it still just sounds like something else. And then there's Unconditional One, the millennial doot do doot doot claims another victim, once again sounds like a fucking Imagine Dragonsified Bright Eyes by way of What's the Story Morning Glory, a mild shrug at best. Unconditional Two is... The fucking female vocals here sound so cheap and hollow, like Karen O of the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs. If you gave her ketamine and a handful of Benadryl and told her to sing a vague refrain that you wrote on a bar napkin, you be my race and religion. What the fuck are you talking about? What are you saying? What does this have to do with anything else on the song? Why are you invoking this? Do you even know what this means? Is it's moonlight on a landmine. What are you talking about? It's portentous nonsense. What passes for structure here is the God awful 2000 synths getting gradually louder and louder as the song goes on. And wow, genius. I guess Peter Gabriel is on here, by the way. And then we get to we, and it's lame. It's lame acoustic indie dreck. Absolutely nothing of a song. To the best of what I can figure, it is trying to be the soft Nebraska Springsteen with synths and a guitar. No structure or definition here other than a minor rise at the very tail end with a hilarious anti-climax. Why the fuck is this the closer? Why the fuck is this an album? Fuck you. Fuck. I mean... Bravo. I just sweat Bravo. out every bit of bourbon I just drank. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to wait until the end to speak, but you've kind of touched on a lot of things I was really going to say anyway. So I'll add a few things now and maybe I'll sort of sum up at the end, but a couple of things I want to add to songs you've already talked about. Um, uh, end of the Empire is really impressive because it's a nine minute song that never starts. <laughs> Um, and, and that's that's really something. Uh, and I, I genuinely find it impressive how much of a nothing experience all nine minutes of this track are. Um, and, and it it's says, also amazing. It's also amazing how, and really this is something that extends to the entire album, how like every single line on it is, uh, it, it reads like when you're, writing an essay in high school and you you want to copy and paste uh something onto your essay but you you go in and change words and you just you just use different synonyms yeah you just break (laughs) out synonyms for certain words so it isn't technically plagiarism like (laughs) it's just like uh, the let me tell you something, Wynn uh, Butler, as someone who has spent many hours this year marking assignments, when students do that, we can tell. And when you do this, Wynn Butler, it's not fucking clever. I mean, Jesus fucking, you know what the worst thing about End of the Empire is? It's not the I unsubscribe. Please. It's not the kind of cringy sort of shit like that, the, the technology of open shit. It's not the fact that it's nine minutes long and never starts and there's no interesting musical ideas. It's the fact that Arcade Fire are Canadian. And let me get <laughs> mad. <laughs> let me get uh-huh. mad on behalf of you guys well, there, for a second here. <laughs> they're as Canadian as it comes. Arcade Fire oh, are, no. are, are This is a, like when Morgan found out about the Jerry Cantrell solo. They're a fucking Canadian band. They are French-Canadian. Um, <laughs> Regine Chassange, Wynn Butler's wife, who sings on this record, is, I think, definitely very French-Canadian. And yet here you have 
a French Canadian band singing about the end of the American empire. Now, <laughs> if I'm mad about that on your behalf, I can only imagine how now that makes you feel because <laughs> it's just, it's always, it's always the French, you know, it's all, they're, they're always, you know, telling tales of the fall of somebody else's empire. Meanwhile, their 15th revolution of the week is happening in their backyard and Paris's streets are burning. Bunch of morons. Go smoke a cigarette elsewhere. <laughs> yes. Now, I want to say, because, Jake, you rightfully shed on the regime, regime's singing in um, Unconditional 2. It's not very good. But I do want to say that, generally speaking, I want to come to the defense of Regine as a singer. Generally, when she's deployed on Arcade Fire Records, she's really great. Ask any Arcade Fire fan. Like, one of the most common picks for the best Arcade Fire song is Sprawl 2 off of the suburbs. And she sings lead on that song. And she hollers her brains out. And it's fucking amazing. She's goddamn brilliant. And just completely falls flat here. Just does not work. I completely agree. Uh, race and religion is, to me, the nadir on a record full of them. Not just, and it's not for wasting Peter Gabriel. It's not for being part two to a song in a suite that seems to have no real tangible connection to part one. It's not no. for being the final blow or the penultimate blow, I guess, on a record that has continually slung suffering in your face. It's not even for the clunky race and religion metaphorical language whatsoever. It's because it is abhorrent as a listening experience. It is utterly devoid of interesting musical ideas, and it's completely fucking shot in the foot. It has the, compl- the most unbearable lyrical dis- fucking nonsense on a record where you have other songs that include lyrics like some people want the rock without the roll but we all know there's no god without soul bruce springsteen you are not you are not even brandon flowers on his worst day that's said i like the lightning (laughs) I mean, it's like no. I, I mean, can't get it's fine. Like, I part, guess like, part two's all right. I, I genuinely like the lightning part one. I mean, part one's all right. Part two, though, genuinely reminds me of like the the most propulsive and anthemic moments of records like the suburbs that I love. And when I'm listening to the lightning part two, I remember the arcade fire that I grew up with. Right, I remember hearing the suburbs for the first time. The propulsion on that chorus a day a week month the year that shit is like it's a taste of what i've always loved about this band and you know what it's it's i think we've talked about this effect before on on the 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 highlights of terrible albums its presence almost makes you hate it more because yes. it's a te- it's a it's a fucking tease of what could have been. The Lightning One and Two was actually the lead single for this record. It was the first music that was released. I remember hearing it and thinking, "This is better than everything now." Fuck. Okay, let's go. I'm here. I'm in. And then it's like a cruel joke when you hear it on this that's, album. That's the worst fucking thing about this whole entire album as a premise is that this follow-up to that is meant to be nothing more than the band engineering a a default victory lap of just oh well it's better than the last one you know what (laughs) fuck you the worst kind of like little detail like that is the most like and there's lots of little kind of musical details like drum refrains and like little vocal things that are deliberate kind of interpolations or references to earlier music i don't really care about any of those that little stuff like is cute and whatever But the most kind of like embarrassing moment on this record uh, is in uh, End of the Empire 4, Sagittarius A. I mean, on the day we record this, we just received uh, on the internet like the very first ever visualization of the black hole at the center of uh, the galaxy, I believe, which is called Mm -hmm. Sagittarius A star, which is what the song is named after. And uh, truly, I feel like we have now a visual representation of that black hole and a sonic representation of it in the form of this song. 
But the most yes. embarrassing uh, part of this entire album in this song is when he says, we unsubscribe, fuck season five, which on its face sounds like a cute little like you know streaming tv reference like maybe like i don't know what they're trying to evoke there like i don't know game of thrones or something i don't know but like when you actually think about it and the uh the annotations on genius helped me to see this it's a reference to their fifth album everything now and them kind of retroactively apologizing for it fuck season five fuck our fifth album we know we fucked up and it's like you have the gall to think that this makes up for that. You have the gall to think that this is an acceptable acknowledgement of the failures of that record. One of the things I realized this week is actually that from listening to this, I have a newfound appreciation for everything now because that record has a point that is not as self-serious as what this record is. Like, of all of the issues this record has, the most categorical, catastrophic failure of it as an Arcade Fire record is that it is joyless. And if an yeah. Arcade Fire record can, should be anything, it should be joyful. It should be triumphant. That's the whole fucking point of this band is to be joyful and triumphant. And you're spending 40 minutes fucking moping and you think, and that's one thing, but you think that that is giving people what they want. On what fucking level does this give us what we want? It's the categorical opposite of why people fell in love with this band. So what's the excuse? Fuck season five? It should have been cancelled before then. The show is over. The last word I have to say on the subject is that it's really ironic that in trying to make a record that calls back to funeral, they have inadvertently made the soundtrack to their own funeral. And it's time to bury this band. I'm done. I, the, if everything now is a worse record than this. It's not, it's just, it's fucking not. Just if that were the case, and I'm not even saying that we shouldn't still do this, but this band should be jettisoned into space. Just, like, it's like we should do with it what we should have done with like all the landfills around here and just shoot it into the stratosphere. Just get off my rock. With Wind Butler on it. Writing it like he's the fucking cowboy in Doctor Strange Love. It explodes. There's a, there's a couple things I can get into here. Um, <laughs> I don't have much of a history with Arcade Fire. Um, there were several times in my life where I've tried to get into funeral, and it never just fully clicked. Um, and I and I owe it to the songs off of that record that I do love like tunnels and rebellion uh, to actually go through and listen to the whole thing. Cause some of those songs are staggering um, and just really impressive, but there, I think really was just like the sort of, it's a similar thing within the airplane over the sea where this, this, the amount of internet, uh, hyperbole around those albums is viscerally off-putting so i just kind of had to be like i don't know you'll get but, there when you, you know get yeah I, i'm far enough away from that now that it's probably worth the reevaluation. um so i i was just like you know seeing that we were reviewing this i was like oh there's there's a new arcade fire how okay we're they're still doing this all right uh the guy just left the other guy the other butler man um yeah. I left after the recording of this album there's like a misconception that he was <laughs> there's a misconception that he was fired but that's not true he left of his own accord and we can only speculate as also. to why that might be yeah um and then i looked and saw that the the first song on here 
was called Age of Anxiety. And not only was it called Age of Anxiety, it was called Age of Anxiety 1, and it was followed by Age of Anxiety 2. And I said, my God, I'm going to hate this. <laughs> and reader, listener, <laughs> I did. I, like, the thing, the thought that I had the most while listening to this album was that sometimes Riley and I don't meet on the same level of boring is worse than bad, uh, or, or, you know, bad is worse, or vice versa. You know, this happens fairly frequently with middling to bad albums uh, that we review on here. There's a sort of split in our perspectives on them. I, I thought to myself over and over again, my God, this is finally the one place we can meet where boring is so much worse than bad. Because make no mistake, this is also bad. Yes. But it is bad because it is so dull. It's like listening to a Walmart PA <laughs> announcement. It doesn't mean <laughs> anything. You have heard it before. It you like and everything that everything that is written or composed on here, words or music, is lifted wholesale from someone else. I mean, I completely stand by the earlier remark of this is a copy and pasted album, at least at least in terms of the, the lyrics alone, if nothing else. Uh, the the fucking your heroes are selling you underwear line on uh, the Sagittarius A star. Um, I I I like there's you're stealing from Welcome to the Black Parade now, so you can watch all your heroes also, sell a like car on, on Mars TV. by David Bowie too. For instance. Like, just like I, you spent this out sitting down and listening to this album is begging Win Butler to have an original thought or at least like an original phrasing, even for 40 minutes. And it just never happens. Even the bright spot on this album, The Lightning 2, is such a desperate cash in on the recent rehabilitation of the killers that it is grossly embarrassing. And I'm a say I'm ashamed to be associated with it just by having by being in a video that has this album's title in it. I I, I don't just stop. S like oh God. you compared this to a Walmart PA speaker message, Morgan. It's funny you say that because I make a point to listen to every album for this podcast that we review multiple times. But the final time I listen to it is always on the day we record. So it is fresh in my memory. So I listened to the albums that we're talking about today, today. And I went to Walmart today to get groceries. And while in there, it was time to play the Arcade Fire album. And I thought, if I listen to this album in this environment, surrounded by people looking at all of these fluorescent lights and cheap grocery products i am going to shoot myself in the head in the middle of this walmart and i did not listen to it until i got home yeah good call you gotta you gotta, I, look, out, you gotta I, look out for yourself sometimes it's funny like um <laughs> no don't worry <clears throat> I, I want to congratulate nigel godrich for you know getting a paycheck i mean everybody needs to eat hey look he produced the smile album that came out this week as well so he can he still got it i i, I do not the blame disparity in quality is quite simply incredible yeah i just i just like have some self-respect man yeah like this is this is the artistic equivalent of selling yourself on the streets. Don't do this ever again. 
at anything least like this. Bites had enough gall to have a like. At least I knew what Stephen Wilson had problems with on that album. He had specific ideas that he hated, and I hated those ideas. Mm. But I knew what they were. I mean, Stephen Wilson wakes up in the morning and craps out better music <laughs> than anything on this. This album is essentially just personal shopper four times. And I would rather listen worse. to Personal Shopper 16 times. <laughs> I would rather, <laughs> I would rather take the exponent. It is the better nine minute times. song. Uh, I, uh, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, Brett, you haven't had a chance to speak yet. And I know that you're, I guess, I take it you're not huge on this record, but maybe you don't have the same level of vitriol as the rest of us. Uh, what's your familiarity with Arcade Fire and what are your overall thoughts here? Um, so, so very similar to Morgan, I don't really have a relationship with Arcade Fire. Um, to be honest, they've been a band that I've kind of avoided for a long time in my life, just because um, I guess the songs that I heard from them, or I guess the songs that I knew about them, um, I just didn't really like at the time. And I just found their style to be really like, I, I don't know, just not my thing. Um, but, you know, ever since I kind of, you know, branched my taste out into different stuff, you know, I was eventually going to check out their stuff. And I still plan on, you know, checking out their first three albums because, you know, they're rated so highly. Um, but, like, <laughs> like I, I can't believe, like, when I, when I first heard this album, I thought I actually liked it. Um, just because, <laughs> I, I don't know, I guess I thought, I guess I thought that, like, the, uh, the, the hook in Age, in, uh, Age of Anxiety was, like, okay. And I didn't really pay attention to the lyrics at that point but um like <laughs> I, I don't even know like how to like describe my experience with this i mean it's like it, it's kind of like um it, it's kind of like watching a car crash in slow motion you kind of just know what's happening but at the same time you can't really stop it um yeah this thing is fucking uh asinine it's completely lifeless it's brainless uh it's like i don't understand like how i don't understand how you can like open up a song like uh, age of anxiety and then like have it have the nerve to have a sweet with it like what are you fucking pink floyd get the fuck out of here like <laughs> there, there's only a few bands who are allowed to fucking do that shit you don't get a right to do that because you're i don't know like i don't, I don't know what goes on there in their head but um yeah, this I, I didn't write anything down for this album because frankly it doesn't deserve my thoughts. Um, it's completely boring. Um, it's just like, like I, I'm having a hard time kind of describing it because, like, frankly, I just don't remember any of the songs on here because they just fly over my head. Um, I There's simply nothing to describe. I'm proud of you for your ability to not have any of it register. It means that we're too far off the deep end. You can still save yourself, Brett. Mm. Honestly, I think I might have a chance. If I get enough bottles of beer in me, then I think I might have a chance to just completely forget this thing. But um, it's just, um, yeah, um, fucking awful. It's um, one of the, like, like, come on, like Race and Religion is the worst song of the year. Like, how do you manage to bring on somebody like Peter Gabriel and make him virtually unrecognizable? Um, like that. What an insult! That, that I mean, honestly, like that's that's a fucking that's a war crime. Uh, speaking of war, why the fuck are you talking about war on this album? What war? What are you talking about? <laughs> Can you're, Canadians, you're a, you're a, famous you're a war rich, indie rocker, dude. You don't have any problems. Shut the fuck up. Also, on, but they're that. fighting a war, Brett. There's <laughs> these are. Black Country, you know, th these are your boys. This is who you were listening to to make this album, really? Pathetic. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, I don't really have anything to say about this other than like, I wish I could just forget every part of this album. Um, it's, it's terribly produced. Um, Age of Anxiety has the most annoying fucking hook that I've heard of the year after that I've heard it multiple times. Um, the, the, what was the fucking song after that oh yeah there's a prelude on here that just sounds like a wet fart uh, what, what like i have never been prelude? i have never in my life been so insulted by an instrumental interlude 
<laughs> it's not even an instrument. There's no, no there's no melodic there's, body here. There's nothing. You wanna, Silence you have a good, would have been like, better. You want to have a good like Silence. 30 second interlude, then take some pointers from the new Let's Eat Grandma album. Uh, okay. a, a, a barren nothing would have been better. Deleting yeah, like, this would yeah, have like been a, like a, heaps better. Like a Geo Gaddy style, you know, couple minutes of silence would have been fine. You know what I mean? But like <laughs> magic just, window, just like just <laughs> exactly. like some some CD era, honestly, uh, I, hidden track space. I would give Age <laughs> of Anxiety. I would give this album a higher rating if Age of Anxiety was just like a twelve minute cover of Idols' Anxiety. <laughs> anyway, honestly, all right. I think oh. I think that we have kind of talked this one in circles, so maybe we should wrap up uh, at this point. Yeah, I don't really have anything else to Just say. To point out that that right now, is when you guys Morgan puts his head down, he looks like he has cat ears. Oh no, oh, not cat girl Morgan. <laughs> cat boy Morgan. Um. All right, let's no. do our. Just gonna need fan Just art of cat boy Morgan. Picks. I will kill you. <laughs> Let's do our least favorite tracks and ratings for Arcade Fire. Pixelate my face. We. Oui. Um, all right, Brett, why don't you go first this time? Uh, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, favorite tracks um, Carry the Zero by Built to Spill, um, To Hear Knows When by My Bloody Valentine, and Sing by Slow Dive. Um, my least favorite track here is uh, fucking the whole album. Um, and this gets a two out of 10. <sighs> Oh, spicy. Okay. Uh, for me, my three favorite, my favorite track three. is the lightning part two. My three least favorite tracks are uh, age of anxiety, sweet, uh, end of the empire, sweet and unconditional sweet. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I guess it's a 2.5. Yeah. Bad album. So, shockingly morgan um yeah in in the spirit of brett's favorite tracks i'm gonna go with uh yeah let's say uh, irresistible by deaf heaven mm, um great uh uh, title and registration by Death Cab for Cutie. I'm just in the D's now on mm. my music library. Um, and uh, Entombed by Deftones. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, I, I, it's hard to say. It's hard to pick between that and uh, uh, the city by the Dismemberment Plan. Uh, Ooh, but, uh, yeah, know, fair enough. Really, you know, great stuff nonetheless. Really can't go wrong. Uh, least good. favorites. I'm going to say end of empire four uh race and religion and the prelude just because it's like somebody uh threw a sand pebble onto my eardrum that's <laughs> the aud audio experience of that thing um may god have mercy on arcade fire one and a half out of ten God may have mercy on Arcade Fire. Arcade Fire, more like Dumpster Fire. It's not revenge my, we're after. It's a my record. favorite song on this album is uh, because August isn't here, because it's been a while since I've heard anyone say this. I'm going to have to give this a hard Chinese satellite by Miss Phoebe Bridgers. My least favorite track is, oh, God, fucking, uh, I mean, like, I, you know, I, I, I probably understated, if anything, even though this is maybe the angriest I've ever been at an album on this podcast, I understated just how much I hate Age of Anxiety 2, parenthetical rabbit hole, a one out of 10 song if there ever was one, God damn it straight to hell 1.5 out of 10 i hate you win butler come shine my shoes fuck you <laughs> all right that means that we get an average of 1.9 for arcade <laughs> <Fire's> <laughs> <Wii>. <laughs> 
let us know what you think of either of the albums we discussed today. Uh, Arcade Fire is we, Sharon Van Etten's we, etc. Uh, we want to hear from you in the comments below, so please let us know. Obviously, we were oh. maybe... I don't want to say we were too harsh, but perhaps some people might not have been expecting us to be like so genuinely hateful uh, towards Arcade Fire. So, Riley, that is the most audibly hateful I've ever heard you sound in this entire podcast tenure. I, I was a little uncomfortable was... when you started yelling I'm not going to lie. I mean, I'm it glad. was like watching Peter Finch lose it on network. <laughs> like, like... <laughs> it really was like watching that monologue and like i was concerned and also in awe <laughs> it was a wonderful thing everybody had a moment yeah. viewers segment. go back and rewind to the moment where riley loses it and i want you to look directly at my face and if it's not the most uncomfortable smile you've ever seen in your life then it's not me i actually feel bad now jake because that that i don't i didn't want to make you feel that way man <laughs> That's not. That's friend, <laughs> friends. Friends should. <laughs> friends shouldn't make each other feel that way, man. Like I, there is an outside force at work here. We just need to keep that in mind. No, but and it's Mr. Winnegan Butler. I right didn't like Winnegan. learning that I was Wendemar incapable Hurt. of this. So it, it's disturbing for me as well. Uh, anyway, let us know what you think at home of either of the records we've discussed today. Uh, if you enjoy the episode, please consider giving it a like. If you want to see more from the channel, please consider subscribing if you haven't already. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, head on over to the YouTube link in the description. You can leave us a comment there. Uh, if you enjoy what we do and you want to support us, you can hit the join button. And for just $1 a month, you can support the channel directly, help us to make these videos, become one of our besties, uh, get your name featured in the title call of every video on the channel, plus get priority comment response. And if you want to recommend us some music to listen to, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile as always though folks rock over london rock on chicago dollar shave club our blades are fucking great